Hello and welcome. I am Beth Mascheski, Senior Scientific Specialist at the Illinois Sustainable Technology Center, which is part of the Prairie Research Institute at the University of Illinois. As a land-grant institution, the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign has a responsibility to acknowledge the historical context in which it exists. In order to remind ourselves and our community, we will begin this event with the following statement. We are currently on the lands of the Peoria, Kaskaskia, Piankasha, Wea, Miami, Muscoutin, Adawe, Sauk, Muskoki, Kickapoo, Potawatomi, Ojibwe, and Chickasaw Nations. It is necessary for us to acknowledge these native nations and for us to work with them as we move forward as an institution. Over the next 150 years, we will be a vibrant community inclusive of all our differences with native peoples at the core of our efforts. This webinar and all of the Illinois Sustainable Technology Center's webinars are certified green events through the University of Illinois Institute for Sustainability, Energy and Environment. To find out more about certified green events through U of I, please visit sustainability.illinois.edu. To find out more about the Illinois Sustainable Technology Center's webinars or to sign up for the events mailing list, please visit istc.illinois.edu slash events. A couple of housekeeping items before we get started. We're working on getting the slides available for you in the handout section of the GoToWebinar toolbar. I'll update you during the question and answer section if those are available. Today's webinar is being recorded. The recording and slides will be available for viewing within about a week. I'll be emailing out um, the availability of those to everyone who registered for the webinar. Everyone will remain muted for the entire webinar. You can type in your questions through the GoToWebinar toolbar and I'll be reading those to the speaker at the end. So with that, I'm very pleased to welcome today's speaker, Hanna Brunig. Hanna is a research scientist and deputy leader in the Sustainable Energy and Environmental Systems Department at Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory. She also holds a secondary joint appointment in the Climate and Ecosystem Science Division. Hanna earned her bachelor's degree in environmental engineering from Cornell University and a master's and PhD in civil and environmental engineering from the University of California, Berkeley. She specializes in systems analyses of early stage energy, water, and waste technologies, which include waste energy resource systems, circular economy, bioenergy, brain management, and gas capture utilization storage technologies for gases such as hydrogen, carbon dioxide, and methane. So Hannah, thank you for joining us and the webinar is yours. Thank you for that introduction. I really appreciate it. And I'm really excited to be here today discussing some of the work that's ongoing at Berkeley Lab, looking at carbon capture, utilization, and sequestration, how it plays a key role in achieving our energy goals. So I'm a civil engineer by training, and I'll be discussing a lot of the aspects around these technologies associated with estimating uh, cost, environmental impacts, both local and globally, as well as how we work hand in hand with fundamental uh, basic science to guide the science at the early stages. So as we know, the situation associated with climate change is getting more and more urgent and we have less time to act. However, we also have to think very strategically about where our investments need to be placed, both in terms of research and development and in terms of actual investment in infrastructure development. We have very ambitious goals in the US working towards the mitigation of greenhouse gas emissions that are contributing to climate change. These include some very big targets, such as reducing carbon emissions by about half by 2030, producing 100% clean energy by 2035, and hitting net zero carbon emissions by 2050. These type of goals are why we're starting to see very ambitious, organized efforts in funding, such as the earth shots that have just been announced by the Department of Energy. This is a great challenge because as of 2019, this shows the CO2 and methane emissions coming from our economy. 
you can see a tremendous amount of emissions are coming from the electrical power generation, as well as industrial use and transportation. Thankfully, we have a number of technologies available that can help drive down emissions, and we're seeing a lot of reduction in the electricity grid emissions associated with the increased penetration of renewable energy. Key in that will be advancing storage systems to help intermittent renewables meet very stable demand. So those are areas where there's some progress. Uh, however, we are understanding now that to reach our goals, we need to actually start to capture point sources of CO2 emissions, as well as start to look at negative emissions technologies, which I'll discuss next. So in this graphic, it shows greenhouse gas emission trajectories on a business as usual case in blue, out to 2050. So based on current policies around the globe, we can see some reduction in greenhouse gas emissions associated with the lowering cost of renewable energy, the more efficient use of energy in buildings and other systems, the use of electricity, electric vehicles as well. However, if we start to ambitiously drive down these emissions, we still will not have enough reduction in CO2 to mitigate climate change to stay below two degrees global warming. This means we need to have negative emissions. So I will discuss a little bit about what that means and what the difference is between negative emissions and neutral emissions. So basically when you have a, let's say a green technology that you're offsetting the use of fossil fuels, you can be neutral. So you're actually avoiding the additional amount of greenhouse gas emissions going into the atmosphere. However, to be negative, you actually have to draw CO2 already in the atmosphere down and store it. So that's the difference between being neutral and being negative. And there's a number of technologies being looked at for negative emissions that I'll discuss in the coming slides. There is a lot of attention on this. As we now realize uh, in 2019, the National Academy of Science put out a report on net negative emissions technologies, the need for them. We now see, or they see there's a very large scale need for negative emissions globally, as well as in the United States. And the amount of science that's coming out around different technologies is very, very impressive. We're seeing focus on the capture of CO2, the utilization of CO2, the way that we can change the way we use land and even work on how we interact with oceans and other uh, large scale systems to draw down CO2. A couple key research opportunities were highlighted in the National Academy of Science report, including improving the negative emissions technologies we're already aware of, such as direct air capture or DAC. Making progress on DAC and carbon mineralization to improve their performance and their energy intensities and lower that so that we aren't uh, building up a lot of technologies that consume an enormous quantity of our renewable electricity. And finally, advancing negative emissions technologies by enabling other systems that are useful for neutral. So biofuels, you use biofuels to offset uh, the use of fossil fuels such as gasoline and diesel. So that is carbon neutral. To make it carbon negative, you would have to capture the CO2 that is inevitably emitted from a biofuel, which is carbon rich, and store it. So that then takes biofuels and turns it into a negative emissions technology. Sequestration could be the geologic injection, uh, storage of CO2. So taking CO2, clustering it, putting it in pipelines and injecting it underground. It by itself could take carbon dioxide from anywhere. It could be a coal power plant but then improving that cost and that performance of those systems, having better understanding of how we use those formations is going to be critical for enabling these negative emissions technologies. So just to put some numbers on the problem here, when we're talking about investing in technologies, we're talking about processing a huge amount of air. So when we look at the targets for how much CO2 we need to remove from the air. It could be any negative emissions technology. We're just talking about how much do we need to draw down. We can actually look at the current concentration of the atmosphere and do a calculation 
so I understand exactly what mass we're talking about. So if we have the concentration of CO2 at about 410 parts per million and by volume today, we can understand the mass of CO2 in the atmosphere and the quantity of CO2 in the atmosphere. If we then think about our target and how we're actually drawing down to lower the concentration and understand exactly how much CO2 is associated with one part per million volume, we can then do a calculation to understand the mass that we have to remove to stabilize our uh, increasing temperatures. So now we have 40733 gigatons of CO2 we have to remove. And if we look at that and compare it to the amount in the atmosphere, we need to process around 16% of Earth's atmosphere. And that is a lot of air. We have never moved any amount of mass like that before in the history of humankind. So this is an enormous problem that we're trying to tackle. And if we're just talking about using direct air capture systems, which are just now emerging, we have a huge scale up issue. So I did some calculations and looking at the targets that IPCC reports have set for uh, BECS, which is bioenergy with carbon capture and sequestration. If they estimate around uh, three gigatons of carbon per year need to be sequestered using BECS by 2100, if we just take that as a target for a technology, and now we set the amount of direct air capture we need to that, it gives us about how much we need to process per year. So about 0.4% of the atmosphere needs to flow through these direct air capture systems a year. And so that's a tremendous challenge for the globe. But if we start to look at the targets that are set by California, by the US, by other countries, we can start to see, okay, what are the actual numbers on these systems? So here I ran at something for the targets for California. We need between 15 and 29 million tons of carbon per year sequestered by 2045 to meet state targets. That range is set on the, the performance of us deploying electric vehicles or the performance of our uh, renewables being deployed. So that's where that, that bound is. And so what does that mean for direct air capture? Well, that means we might need between 50 and 100 or so of these mega facilities, direct air capture facilities, sequestering CO2 by 2045. So that gives you just a sense of the issue. So this is why systems analysis such as myself are very critical at times like these, is to provide some context for how much do we need? What would that do to the amount of the technology that's being deployed, what might that imply for the costs of these systems, the amount of land coming out of them, and then how do we work backwards with the basic scientists who are developing these technologies to give them a sense of what targets they need to hit for their, their systems. And these negative emissions technologies will be made up of many assets, and some of these are going to be very early stage. Enhanced weathering is one example where you take uh, mineral rocks filled with minerals like olivine that are very reactive with CO2. You grind them up to increase their surface area and you spread them on land. That is a very early stage technology with a lot of promise, but also a lot of research questions around its deployment. Then you can focus on other assets such as bioenergy, which are much more mature and deployed, but we need more of them. And we need to start thinking critically about how do you take the carbon dioxide that's captured there and either use it and turn it into products or store it underground? And so I use a couple tools such as life cycle assessment and techno-economic analysis to look at the assets and start to guide the research. So when you look at the life cycle, you have a range of issues going from permitting and purchase, operation and maintenance, refurbishment, and end of life and disposal, as well as the use phase. And so based on fundamental engineering principles, policies, and regulations, I can start to bound what the potential location, scale, and operating performances will be for these systems. I can look at the capital expenses as well as the operating expenses, such as electricity and fuel to drive a technology, and start to estimate the cost of owning these systems over a period of time. So if I'm looking at two competing technologies, 
I can use cost to work backwards and say technology one is likely to be more expensive than technology two. However, my, do my job doesn't stop there. I can go one step or two steps further and actually start to say, what is the breakdown of these costs? How is that linked to research and development? Are there opportunities for research that could lower these costs? And perhaps technology two could be substantially cheaper than technology one, not just close, with the appropriate research and development investments. So that's how I work hand in hand with other scientists at Berkeley Lab to guide research and help accelerate the pace of breakthrough technologies. So in this talk, I'll discuss uh, the CO2 capture, and that could be point source capture, whether it's a biological source or a source at a, at a power plant or an industry. And I'll talk about direct air capture, which is the actual drawdown of carbon dioxide from the air. So now you have that CO2, and what do you do with it? There are a range of different choices that you can do. You can store it, such as geological sequestration. You can store it long-term by reacting it and turning it into a mineral. And you can make either construction materials like cement from that, or you can take the rocks that I mentioned previously and apply them to land, which can sometimes have improvements for the soil quality. That work is being advanced at Berkeley, and there's a lot of questions that are very interesting around what is the cycle of carbon in these systems and what is the scale needed to, uh, to perform that on different types of land. Then there's chemical conversion. So you can say, take CO2 and you can react it to turn it into a chemical, a fuel, or a plastic. You can do that thermochemically, or you can do that electrochemically. And ideally, we would do that electrochemically so that we don't need high, high temperatures and other things driven by natural gas or electricity to drive it. We're trying to improve the low temperature electrochemical systems that I'll discuss a little bit in this talk. But then you have to think about what is the product life cycle coming from that as well. If you just create a substitute for diesel, you've now done a whole bunch of work taking CO2 from the atmosphere, similar to what a plant would do. And then you are offsetting your fossil fuel. So you're only neutral because you're emitting that CO2 back into the atmosphere. To have long-term storage, we need to think about what is the end use, such as plastics that could be giving us over 100 years of sequestration, which is where we need to be for really relevant uh, storage and offset. And then finally, we have biological conversion. You could act like a greenhouse and take that CO2 and actually grow more biomass, or you can use biological pathways to convert that CO2 the same way you do with electrochemistry. Now, from a life cycle perspective, all of these stages are inefficient. All of these stages have losses of CO2. So when we work backwards to set our targets for these technologies, we need to think very carefully about what is the very practical expectation we have on the CO2 emissions in this life cycle, and what is the, what is the value of investing in these technologies to have meaningful offsets of carbon dioxide. Some studies have started to come out looking at other aspects of these technologies beyond just the greenhouse gas emissions. I really, really appreciate this paper for doing a comparison of energy consumption, land footprint, negative emissions, water consumption of a few leading types of uh, negative emissions technologies, including enhanced weathering with the rocks, direct air capture, bioenergy with carbon capture, and reforestation. So you can see direct air capture doesn't require a lot of water but it has a lot of uncertainties on the amount of emissions that could be associated with it, especially associated with its high, high energy demands here. 156 exajoules per year to power DAC. That is a huge number when we're thinking about the scales that I just introduced. So that comes up to a question of where are we going to find the renewables to power that system? Are those renewables going to be uh, dependent on weather, or are we going to have some base loads such as geothermal or hydrogen? So this is some of the questions that I'm answering my work, looking at the coupling of direct air capture with renewables, and we're starting to understand more and more that you can't just assume these systems are going to be run on um, 
what's called curtailed renewables, which is the availability of renewables when everyone's asleep and no one's using energy, such as wind blowing at night in Texas. That is becoming very complicated, partly because of how utilities operate and just following costs. So now we're starting to think and realize that we need dedicated renewable farms to drive these systems. So when we talk about direct air capture, we have a lot of words bouncing around these days. I really like this infographic that shows all the types of words, hot words that are coming out around the advancement of direct air capture. And you'll see right there in the center is the sorbent. This is the material or liquid that is used to actually uh, absorb the CO2. So you have CO2 flowing through, you absorb it on a material, and then you have to get the CO2 back off. This is how the direct air capture system works. And absolutely driving material research right now are questions around finding and developing materials that can do a better job at this. So working with a few scientists at UC Berkeley, including the Jeff Long Lab that develops sorbents such as material, metal organic frameworks, we just got awarded by DOE a basic energy science grant for um, funding a four-year project looking at how do we develop adsorbents that can do a much, much better job at this. And what do I mean by better job? I mean looking at key material targets to hit to drive down the energy demand and improve the amount of CO2 that can be captured for every cycle. So since some of you might not be familiar with direct air capture systems, I'm gonna walk you through what that actually is. So subsystem one, you have compressors and, and fans and other things that are flowing air through these systems. So they're moving it, and in some cases they need to preheat it. That air is just ambient air, so it might have uh, contaminants, it might have moisture, it might be um, very high in uh, nitrogen. And so we have to think about what's coming into the system. And so this is flowing through the direct air capture unit, which has the sorbent in it. It's captured and you can have like a breakthrough where you have now full absorption achieved. You close off the system and then you have to regenerate which means forcing the CO2 off of that sorbent material so that you have a CO2 rich flow and a CO2 poor flow. So this system has a cycle where you have the unit preconditioned, you're absorbing the system, and then you're regenerating it to remove the CO2. And there's a lot of questions around here on how do you identify a material that has very high selectivity for the CO2 but not so high that it takes so much energy to drive off that CO2. We need a sorbent that can handle the presence of moisture, which is a very big challenge because many sorbents are highly sensitive and degrade rapidly in the presence of water. So there's some advances that we've found to understand the materials, but there's also a very exciting area of research going on looking at how do we improve the thermal regeneration of these systems. So a lot of people talk about the uh, energy associated with direct care, air capture, but what they don't realize is a majority of the energy is going to be associated with the heat, not necessarily the electricity of this system. And we don't understand fully how these systems are heated and how it could be more optimally, optimally heated. So if you're interested in this work, we actually are currently hiring and looking for a postdoc in this area and if you have any interest in this project, please reach out to me. So that project is going to be ongoing and I'll be leading the um, process modeling and systems analysis of this, working hand in hand with material scientists looking at developing and discovering these emerging materials. So one of the reasons that makes this so challenging is if you look at your, your fundamental theory around separation of anything, there's a minimum energy associated with that. So when we talk about carbon capture at point sources, we have much higher concentrations in the flows that our systems are seeing. So that lowers the energy of separation. In comparison, direct air capture, where you have very low concentrations of CO2, relatively speaking, you have a much higher energy to separate out these systems. So we already know there's a minimum energy that 
cannot be avoided, that we have to provide. The rest of the system, the recovery and regeneration and all these other things, are now the space that we can use science and technology and fundamental and engineering principles to improve upon. Such as looking at the way that these absorbents interact under different pressures and temperatures. This is very, very exciting new research, looking at how a traditional absorbent behaves. So this is uh, an isotherm. If you have a certain pressure, you're increasing pressure here you see the uptake of carbon dioxide over time. And so as you change this curve, you start to see from your starting pressure to your ending pressure, this difference here and here, or here and here, you start to see the amount of CO2 that you can actually load onto the system and get back off of the system if you're swinging this pressure swing. Um, and you can see the shape affects it quite a bit. So here you have a very small uptake compared to potentially a system that looks like this. So this is a cooperative absorption system where instead of a rigid crystal, you actually have a mechanism where under a certain pressure, it pops open and behaves differently. So now under a certain pressure swing, you can have a very large uptake to work with. So this is very exciting, but we also know very little about how to engineer the storage tank and the thermal properties, uh, the, the pressure swings around these units. Even the fundamental modeling of these systems is very complex. This is a Langmuir isotherm that's traditional. We know how to model this very well. But when we're guiding material discovery, we need to understand how to properly model these things in our simulations. So this is work that my postdoc Peng Peng and my PhD student Stephanie Collins are working with me to actively learn how to develop process models around these systems. So going back to the life cycle thinking, we talking about direct air capture because we think of it as a negative emissions technology, but it's a good reminder that if we screw up how we operate the system and what electricity or thermal energy we're providing it. We can have a lot of CO2 emissions associated with its capture. And also if we use materials that require uh, the mining of rare earth elements or other expensive energy expensive materials, we can have a lot of upstream CO2. So it's a good reminder that we need to work hand in hand, basic sciences and life cycle assessments to understand how to minimize these penalties and maximize the amount of CO2 captured. This is very important to do well early because we're going to be deploying a lot of these units. As I mentioned earlier, to reach some of the IPCC goals, we're talking about a lot of large scale plants. So California, I had 50 to 100 of these mega units to meet our goals. But if we're talking about global targets, it's 30,000 of these mega facilities to meet these goals. And of course, I'm saying this just from a big picture perspective, we're going to have other technologies in play beyond direct air capture that will help us meet some of these targets. But this is an idea of the amount of direct air capture we'll need to deploy if it were to solve the problem. If you're looking at the more modular designs of systems, such as the ones presented by Climeworks in Europe, that is very exciting, but also still quite small size. We're talking about 33 million of these units. So can you think about your grandchildren walking through the street and we are familiar with seeing power lines, power stations, other technology infrastructure. I kid you not, direct air capture units, if we're going to be deploying at this scale, are going to become a commonplace thing in our infrastructure. And that is just a total different mindset on how we start to think about humans' interaction with the environment and with our urban systems. So I'd mentioned before also the impacts of renewables. We also need to think about this from an environmental justice perspective. We have many different needs for renewable energy, such as powering the air conditioners that are going to be driving um, the buildings that we live in, in an increasingly warm climate. We also have industries that are being powered that we have a very hard time electrifying 
it's really hard to create iron and steel with electricity. So we need to think about the ways that that renewable might be used to power hydrogen or might be used to couple in other ways with our industries. So we need to think carefully about how much of this renewable we're talking about. That being said, we have to power our net, uh, direct air capture systems with renewables because if we're just using our current electricity grid, we're going to have some problems. So if you look at the carbon emissions associated with electricity, clean electricity, I'm talking about wind and solar has some life cycle uh, emissions associated with it, geothermal, bioenergy. If you look at the California electricity grid, which has a very uh, increasing renewable penetration, high hydrogen and geothermal baseloads, we have about 200 grams of CO2 equivalents for every kilowatt generated. Now, if we look at the average US grid, not even the worst grid, the average, it's double that. So if we power a direct air capture system today, not with the advances that you know we're hoping to discover, but just the current performance of today's direct air capture systems, what are we talking about? So I broke it down into the solid direct air capture, like material base that I presented, and then there's liquid ones, which are electrified, which I won't talk much about today. And you look at the amount of electricity and the amount of heat needed. That leads to penalties that are unacceptable. So for this system, it's mostly powered on electricity. And if we're using the average US grid, 64% of the CO2 that you even captured would be emitted just associated with the energy to drive it. So this is why we're even talking about this today and why we realize there's so much work to be done to develop these systems further. So the next thing I'll talk about is what do you do with the CO2 once you've captured it? And where can systems analysis come to play to help guide this research? So even today, we have a lot of uses of CO2. Believe it or not, CO2 is actually produced from geological reservoirs today to serve a lot of our basic needs. Despite all of our problems with CO2, we are having to actually get CO2 from the ground to serve some of our uses. CO2 utilization could be uh, also associated with some emerging uses, such as advanced ways of making materials and chemicals and fuels with these, and I'll talk a little bit about that. But by and large, when we look at the uses of CO2, the largest ones and the most mature ones that are cost effective is EOR, which is enhanced oil recovery. Taking CO2 and injecting it underground into oil and natural gas reservoirs that have been active for a while, they've lost some of that pressure that really made it easy and cheap to get the oil and gas up. Actually, if you take CO2 and you pressurize it and put it underground, you can boost the pressure in that system and make it cheaper again to recover the oil and natural gas in that system. Very cost effective to do, very mature technology, and can store CO2 at large scales. Of course, the problem here is that we are now being coupled with a fossil fuel industry. So this is both a nice opportunity for getting the ball going and getting the cost driving down, giving direct air capture time to lower its cost, but we can also do better than just enabling the enhancement of oil. So there's some real challenges around what do we do with the CO2. That's why there's been a lot of work looking at how do you convert CO2 in a way that's uh, not energy intensive and producing products from it. This shows the CO2 supply and demand today. As I mentioned, the CO2 supply is coming substantially from natural wells that are taking that CO2 out of the ground that's naturally made. There's also CO2 capture at ethanol refineries throughout the world. So that's a biogenic source of CO2, as well as ammonia and hydrogen uh, facilities. And then there's the merchant demand today. A ton of CO2 is used in food processing and carbonated beverages. And so even today, the demand for CO2 is very small. It's 11 million metric tons. It's smaller than the amount of CO2 even supplied today. So what in the world is going to happen if we take a ton of direct air capture units or a ton of point source capture units and have all of this CO2 on the market? 
we have absolutely no market for that today. The value of that is going to come from policy, putting a price tag on that carbon avoidance and starting to drive industry to make revenue in that way. And then also creating new markets for CO2 demand by creating products from CO2 that offset our fossil fuels. So this is a real challenge and mismatch of knowing we need to create massive amounts of CO2 and having no markets ready for that. So this is an area that can be improved upon and I'll discuss a little bit today. So I wanted to mention one pitfall associated with how we think about these systems. It is very, very important for us to remember that if you are a facility who wants to purchase CO2 from a direct air capture facility, that CO2 isn't free from a life cycle perspective. As we just discussed, it takes energy and upstream materials with associated emissions to capture that CO2. So we have to treat the CO2 like any other project. We have to ask questions around what is the cost of that CO2, who is purchasing it, and what would the credit be? Who would get the credit for using that CO2? So capturing that CO2 at a point source, if it's from a power plant, a coal power plant, it has associated emissions. So this is just what I mentioned before. When we think about a direct air capture facility or something, that CO2 that's captured, it could be you know, a million tons of CO2. That's not the total offset because we have those upstream emissions to subtract now. So now going forward, we are thinking about creating new markets for CO2. There's the current thermochemical conversion where you take petroleum, you find it into products like ethylene, which is currently one of the largest chemicals produced in the US. And uh, we are thinking about now in the future, driving this with cheap, hopefully, renewable electricity to power these systems without the additional combustion. And so here you can either do it separately where you first create electricity and then you couple it with CO2, or we're starting to think about coupled systems such as photoelectric uh, processes that have the photovoltaics and the CO2 all produced together in one unit. Either way, you're taking that and generating a product and then we're asking questions around what are the early wins here? So high value products are clearly gonna be exciting because we know that there's a market for that and we would get a lot of revenue from selling it. Now we need to look at what are the catalysts to drive those reactions. Or you can look at the very large scale demands such as hydrogen or even making methane from these systems. But then it becomes questions again of what is the value of doing that? with the CO2 and how do you capture and storage? So here's another pitfall. If the CO2 is captured, then you need to also think about who is getting the credit for that CO2. So in life cycle assessment, if you have a system that creates more than one product, you need to start to allocate your life cycle impacts to those different uh, products. So if we look at a reference case where we just have electricity and methanol being generated, you have associated impacts with those units of electricity here, the kilowatts generated and the methanol generated. Now if we're going to propose a new world where captured CO2 is used to make methanol, we have to think about what would be the change in our greenhouse gas emissions and who gets credit for that. So in this system, we have a power plant capturing CO2, not direct air capture, just a power plant. There's some associated impact of doing that capture because it's energy intensive, but that power plant is still continuing to generate its electricity. Now it's also giving the CO2 to a methanol synthesis process. That methanol synthesis process requires, if it's just taking CO2, it requires hydrogen to come in, which has its own life cycle implications. So now you have the same two products being here and you have to start thinking about both of those products and the full life cycle. I bring this up because we have a big challenge here. There are a lot of companies quite interested in driving down their CO2 impacts. But if you just have the power plant facility thinking about what it's doing and the methanol facility thinking about what it's doing, 
you might not be able to understand how they're doing their carbon accounting properly and whether they're looking at the holistic picture here. So this is why also policymakers are working very closely with life cycle assessments, uh, engineers and system analysts to learn how to write these policies and how different companies can apply for these carbon offset credits in a way that is very fair and uh, properly accounting. So in these two systems, in this case, it would be a win. You would actually have about a 59% reduction in the total systems that would, uh, the total CO2 emissions associated with methanol and electricity, but that's not always the case. So in this case, this is showing the same thing of the methanol producer's perspective, the avoided burden that they think they're getting from their accounting, not looking at it holistically. They might even think that they're making negative emissions. But from the electricity producer's perspective, they may actually say, well, what's the value here? I'm actually going to increase my CO2 emissions. So this becomes a real challenge for how do we do the carbon credits and looking at how policies are accounting for these different systems. So for the sake of time, I'm gonna keep moving on here. And I'm going to go to now some biogenic sources of CO2. So when we talk about how a plant behaves, it takes, draws down CO2 from the atmosphere. And if you use that biomass to generate energy or hydrogen or anything, you can also capture the CO2 from it. And if you store it underground, now you are a negative emissions technology. But if you're simply releasing that CO2, whether you're, it's at the tailpipe of your vehicle or at the power plant, you've offset fossil fuels. So you're carbon neutral, but you're not carbon negative. And unfortunately, if you actually have a um, bioenergy facility that's very energy intensive, you could not offset that much CO2 at all. So there's some considerations around uh, bioenergy, but one of the most important things is that it's growing as a mature technology and it's considered one of those early, early wins for large scale CO2 capture and utilization and sequestration. So in California, there was a study called Getting to Neutral from Livermore National Lab looking at the cost of CO2 capture. And they found that uh, the use of direct air capture with injection of the, the CO2 underground, whether it was solvent-based or geothermally powered, so using geothermal heat to drive it, so that's kind of a win if you couple those systems, still very expensive, uh, versus the use of the bioass for making hydrogen and then capturing that CO2 and injecting it underground. So it was very exciting to see some of these numbers coming out and seeing the trade-offs between the point source CO2 capture and what you do with that CO2. In their case, the CO2 is being used for just injecting underground. And so this again leads to some questions of where are we advancing our technologies? And my perspective is we have a lot of opportunities for both. It's going to depend on your location. Are you located close to CO2 pipelines and storage? or where you could potentially develop those? Are you close to large sources of uh, demand for the product? And so these are some of the trade-off analysis that we're doing at Berkeley today. So for the sake of time, I might speed through these, but I just wanna comment that California has a lot of, lot of very ambitious targets for reducing the amount of organic waste that comes into the landfill. By 2025, we want 75% diversion. So this is creating a lot of very cheap waste that's carbon and hydrogen rich that could be used for um, offsetting our landfill emissions, offsetting the, the um, burning of agriculture residues and being used to capture CO2. So in the landfill, you have wet waste usually going in, but there's a lot in California of low moisture solids, such as forestry residues in the north, a lot of dead trees have emerged because of our drought and bark beetle infestation. And so we've been looking at, um, can you actually harvest these materials and power bioenergy to, to being deployed in the state? And so some of the work coming out of Berkeley that I led with Corinne Scown and Sarah Smith has developed a tool where you can actually look at the feedstocks in the state and predict based on current prices for electricity or whatever you're gonna use your bioenergy for, what could you use 
and where could you locate those facilities? So in green, these are gasification facilities. So that's where you take the material and you can create electricity with the syngas, which is hydrogen or something else. I didn't look at the capture of CO2 from these facilities, but you can see just from this map, if these facilities were to capture their CO2, now you're starting to see nice clusters of CO2 sources. So potentially we could push policymakers to develop pipelines in these areas and start to drive it down towards the south or north where there are basins for CO2 injection. So again, there are opportunities for doing these things smartly that range from the basic fundamental science all the way up to how you develop a policy. And I know we started a few minutes late, but I don't want to go too far over, so we have plenty of time for questions. So I might just move ahead. This analysis was looking at the implications of the pricing of things on how much CO2 you get. Um, let's see, I'm going to pause so I can, my screen so I can jump to the end. And so I'll just conclude by saying there is need for benchmarking progress in a lot of different areas when we talk about the deployment of carbon capture utilization and sequestration. Starting from how the CO2 is captured, whether it's captured from bioenergy or biological means, enhanced weathering or direct air capture, whether it's going to be driven by different types of energy generation and the need for energy storage to help smooth the variable energy and serve these needs, the use of CO2, its transformation, the offset of that and its performance, whether that's also driven by renewable electricity, or whether there are situations where CO2 storage, transport, and geologic sequestration is going to serve you best and be the best first step for a region. And with that, I'd just like to say that, again, we have an opening in here. So if you're interested, please reach out. I'm pretty active on Twitter, so you can find me there or LinkedIn. And at this point, I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you. Thanks, Anna. Very interesting presentation. You've given us so much to think about. Um, I will remind our audience that you can type in your questions through the GoToWebinar toolbar. I'll be reading those to Hannah. Um, and then I also was able to post the slides in the handout section of the GoToWebinar toolbar, so you're able to download that now. I'll start off our question session with a question that I got in my email box yesterday. Um, they ask, what actions or research you are aware of that will encourage businesses to reduce their overall CO2 output so that there's less CO2 in the atmosphere to capture? Uh, great, great question. And I, I fully support this, uh, <laughs> the mentality that we should uh, be working on driving down our current point sources of CO2 rather than, um, than just focusing completely on these extreme negative emissions technologies. There are, um, I guess I can go back to the slide that looks at the CO2. So I'm just gonna skip back over. Let's see here. All right. Uh, okay, so I'll skip back over to this. So. If you're talking about, these are all the point sources as of um, 2016 of greenhouse gas emissions. There are technologies for uh, driving down CO2 in each of these. If you're talking about the electricity grid, you uh, are, can think about just increasing the price of, of the penalty you place on them for being emitters. So now they even either have to adopt the best standard technology for capture, or they have to actually um, purchase carbon credits, which then subsidizes other groups who are actively doing carbon capture. You also have the drive down of cost of the renewables to just increase that penetration. And by and far, one of the most important technologies for driving that is storage, long duration storage. We're starting to see with the flux of solar and wind, that we need greater than 10 hours of storage to help smooth that and support the grid taking on all these renewables. 
Now we've learned that batteries are very, very competitive, but not beyond about 10 hours. So what technologies can we look at? And that's one of the big earth shots that the DOE has announced is long duration storage. Now, when you look at industries, sources of CO2, you're thinking about some of these mega, mega uh, large industries such as iron and steel processing. And there are a range of technologies being explored for how do you, instead of reduce iron with coke or coal or natural gas, you're actually going to use hydrogen. I mentioned this a little bit in the talk, where now you're using hydrogen to reduce it, you're lowering the CO2 emissions, but it comes to a question of where is that hydrogen coming? Iron and steel facilities are very large, and I have a project looking at the integration of renewably sourced hydrogen with these facilities. We're finding it's very feasible. The upfront capital cost is going to be tremendous. So in terms of what can policy do, policy needs to provide clear signals to these industries that it's going to be consistent, that it's going to keep going and not change administration to administration and lower the risks of this investment as well as provide ways that they can increase their return on investment from that high upfront capital cost. So those are just some examples of ways to drive down existing point sources. Uh, now we're moving on to live questions. Uh, someone asks, is there much research being done with ocean storage? So this is not my area of expertise, so I'll just say that up front. However, there is uh, there's a growing body of literature looking at ways you can um, make sure the ocean remains a good large sink for CO2. There's a couple more kind of geoengineering approaches, which is looking at how do you couple ocean storage and carbon uh, and mineralization. Uh, so kind of also the seeding of the ocean to improve its uh, capture of CO2. And then finally, we're looking at, uh, there have been some discussions about, can you just grow tons of algae with the sole intention of letting it die and float to the bottom of the ocean? So there's a lot of questions around what can we do with the ocean? Um, this is outside my expertise, but I also see it as a very interesting uh, potential field for research. It just needs to be very reasonably bound in terms of the risks and the costs. Uh, we have a request for comments on Climeworks opening the world's largest carbon capture facility in, I in Iceland. Yeah, so a very, very exciting to see this. Um, they have previously had their facility actively taking uh, CO2 and selling it to a greenhouse to grow, uh, to enhance the biomass. So that was just kind of to get them off the ground. And one of the key things there was just the um, very unique conditions of that, not very scalable, but also very promising to see that they demonstrated that it can be done. Now, seeing their work where they're actually going to inject the CO2 into a basalt formation. So I actually have a slide I'll show you. So this is, um, we talk about enhanced weathering where you have reactive rocks. Oh, we don't rocks. see the slides updating. Oh, I'm gonna, I, I pause it so I can uh, jump to it without showing you all the mess of my slide deck. Um, okay, cool. So we'll go to this slide. So yeah, this is, this is basically what's happening is you have a basaltic rock formation where you're injecting CO2 underground. And what's very exciting about this formation versus conventional CO2 um, storage is here, you basically have the CO2 like a liquid. It can spread, it can move throughout that formation, which is very porous. That's why we inject it in the first place. And we're very worried that most of the world has been punctured with wells at one time or another. There's, uh, you know, seismic activity can happen. There's all sorts of ways that that CO2 could eventually uh, contaminate and acidify water bodies or be, be even released back in the atmosphere. Basalt formations within, they're now saying potentially within three years or less, that CO2 reacts and becomes a mineral 
and is very, very securely trapped in this formation. So it's a, a very promising coupling of direct air capture with this system. One of the key challenges, while that company has a number of journal articles published on technology, the estimates around how much, uh, what their cost is, are, I would say, need to be explored further because there are questions around, are they getting their energy for free? What, uh, what is the actual advancement in their technology that they're claiming they'll do to drive down their numbers? If you're seeing numbers for direct air capture that are lower than $200 per ton, that's very, very uh, optimistic and promising. That's what that's you know where we're headed towards. Um, more reasonable numbers that we've seen for these systems is a thousand dollars per ton of CO2. So if they can demonstrate that they're driving down costs in a in a way a timely manner from a thousand to something more like 500 or below, that already is a hugely valuable win for for this field. We don't have any more from our online audience. Um, so while they're thinking, I will ask one of my own. Um, what is the number one research need for uh, making a significant impact in this field? Oh, wow. Uh, <laughs> that's, uh, I mean, that's I feel one. like it's hard to be, it's hard to be, uh, yeah, it's hard to be non-biased there. I, I will go back to the National Academy of Science saying that um, really we need demonstration of these systems. So I'd say anything that can advance the time from discovery to pilot phase where we're starting to collect data would be most important. From my work, how I operate in this space, the most important thing for me to have is experimental data that I can put into my process models that are going to be representative of the operation conditions that we think they're gonna be working at. So number one, the hardest challenge for me is developing process models where it's like garbage in, garbage out. It's a very complex mathematical model. And yet, if I don't know how that fundamental science, the Zorbin or whatever it is, is really gonna operate, again, like what is mud is my service here? So working with scientists, having grants that can couple scientists and systems analysts so that they can go do the experiments, give me the data, and I can start to understand exactly what the system will look like, I'd say is like, is the grand challenge and, we're, and the change, the shift in the paradigm of how we conduct science that is needed, I think, to advance this field. Uh, one from our online uh, uh, member in a similar strain, uh, what key advancement needs to happen to make uh, direct air capture economically feasible? Yeah, so there's different types of direct air capture, as I mentioned, um, and you go back to the, the targets for materials, that's going to be um, improving separation improving the speed of uptake, improving um, how the sorbent behaves in the presence of contaminants in air such as moisture, and really, really improving the, the cycling, the durability of these materials so that they can be cycled quite, uh, you know, thousands of times. Uh, that's for the material side. For the engineering side, we have a real challenge to uh, lower the energy intensity of the system altogether. So being able to recover the CO2 without excessive swings in heat or vacuums, um, lowering the energy losses associated with desorbing the water. Let's say the water was co-adsorbed with that system. It takes a lot of energy to remove that water. And um, also just filling the gap in our lack of understanding around how we're delivering that thermal energy. So that's one key uh, piece of the technology itself. The integration of it will have to come down to what land is available. These direct air capture units, you can think of them like a wind farm. They can't be one after another, like breathing in the air and then breathing out, you know, CO2 lean air into the next one. So we need a lot of spacing for these and we don't know anything about that. Um, there's also opportunities for siting them somewhere where there's, you know, we can you somehow leverage wind or, or the flow of air in a smart way. There's a lot of outstanding questions around where are these gonna be located. 
And so I think those are where the real key challenges are. The, the whole separate piece associated with its um, successful deployment is gonna come down to, again, what do you do with that CO2? So there's some real questions around, around the whole integration of systems. We're reaching close to our end of our hour. I'll ask this final question from our audience member. Enhanced weathering, will it need to be situated close to appropriate sources of sequestration media and what areas of land may be needed? Kilometers squared. And does this combined this does this combine with biomass sequestration regionally? Okay, a lot of pieces there. So my first suggestion is just shoot me an email so we can chat about this. There's, there's a lot of work being done in enhanced, uh, enhanced weathering and, and um, the answers to some of those questions are gonna vary in their maturity. So first and foremost, enhanced weathering, we, we know largely where those materials are. Um, and so we know where we would have to mine them uh, to take those rocks, crush them up, and then you can either crush them small enough that they can capture CO2 ambient, so you apply them to soils or something else. And the, the link with bioenergy is that if you are enhancing the soil with enhanced weathering materials, that's a whole separate topic of chemistry, but you can enhance the biomass grown there and maybe use that biomass for making biofuels or, or just improved crop production. So yes, there's, a, there's questions around what is the cheapest thing to transport? Is it the rock? Um, is it co-locating with a source of CO2? So there are other questions around whether you can actually take um, those rocks or let's say industrial wastes like slag that mimic, that have the same chemistry that you can leverage and uh, doing it more in a reactor design. So you're speeding up the amount of CO2 that's carbon uh, mineralized. And so then, yeah, you would wanna think about co-locating those materials with your direct air capture or your source of CO2. And um, there are questions around, what do you do with those wastes if you're gonna take industrial waste? A lot of them contaminated, so now it may no longer be feasible to apply that to soils where you're growing crops. So you have to think about, um, there's some interest in taking old mines and using those as facilities for uh, storing the materials or even getting some of those original materials. But yeah, there's a lot of pieces to that question, but um, I think the main point is enhanced weathering is still in its early stages and it's gaining momentum. And uh, LBNL just funded a two-year project looking at the use of enhanced weathering with um, earth science and the enhancement of crops. So stay posted and reach out to me if you have questions on that. Great, uh, thanks Hannah for an excellent presentation and wonderful discussion. If we didn't get to your question or you think of something later, feel free to reach out to Hannah. Her, her information is in uh, her slide deck and I will be emailing out um, the availability of this recording and the slide deck once those are posted. Thank you. Thank you very much.